Welcome everyone. My name is Megan McKelvey and I am the manager of department and membership services for the League of California Cities. Welcome to our 19th webinar in our COVID-19 webinar series. Today we are talking about rethinking economic development. As you know, the coronavirus has rapidly changed the way that cities operate. And in order to meet these moments, the League has been producing these webinar series so that you can learn from each other. So please ask questions. Next slide. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. If you um, are gonna verbally ask a question, please make sure that your audio is connected. You can do that through the audio settings on the bottom of your screen. All of you are muted and this webinar will be recorded. For this webinar and past webinar series, you can visit cacities.org backslash coronavirus. Next slide. So we want you to participate. Our speakers will be taking two ways of, uh, of questions today. First is through the Q&A chat box. So type in your question and we'll get to it in a timely manner. Uh, second, we will be taking verbal questions raise your hand and we will call on you and unmute you. Now our webinar is only an hour long, so we are gonna um, get as many questions in as possible, but please be patient with us. So today we are going to be talking about the city's roles and economic development. We all know that it has changed drastically since COVID-19 and cities need to consider new strategies to better and create Today, we have two great speakers um, speaking today. We have John Kiesler, the Director of Economic Development for the City of Long Beach, and Nick Schultz, the uh, Executive Director for Pacific Gateway Workforce. So we're gonna turn it over to John to start the presentation. They have a lot of great information. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to actually uh, uh, share my screen. So um, I'm, I'm moving over to our presentation here. And um, I'm really appreciative of the invitation. I think that this is an issue, um, you know, the role that uh, local governments play in uh, economic development, it's changing. And um, we have really been put to the test. And I'm sure many of our uh, uh, participants today have been put uh, to the test in the past three months, uh, particularly with the incredible economic uh, damage um, that, that COVID-19 has done um, on, a, on an international as well as a, a local level. Um, so, so I think we wanted to start a little bit, just to talk a little bit how the strategy has shifted. Um, you know, in the, in, in the history of, of economic development departments, I think that the focus had always been uh, that economic development departments were, were built and designed to make money for City Hall. Um, they really were um, uh, tax and fee generators to create revenue, to pay for services like public safety, uh, infrastructure, all of the core uh, services that uh, cities provide. So whether big or small in the state of California, these economic development departments really focused on um, how to boost revenues uh, to City Hall. And um, through the redevelopment era, uh, going back about 70 years now when, it's, when it began, uh, there was a real focus on real estate development because ultimately real estate development was uh, the, the, the material, it was the, the good that we had to offer uh, when it came to um, uh, investments by uh, businesses, developers. Um, it was the, the, the land was what we had to offer. And so we, we leveraged that land, we secured uh, uh, debt or, or loans through tax increment finance, financing to make investments um, on that land to build infrastructure and to attract private sector capital, uh, which ultimately then created a virtuous cycle of, of boosting the value, the property tax, the, the sales tax that, that, that took place uh, through the economic transactions. Um, and, and land was really um, our, our greatest asset. Um, the regulation of that land also was a, was a major, major asset because we could regulate what types of businesses uh, what types of permitting and licensing was required. So we had a lot of, of levers to pull when it came to land use and the fiscalization or monetization of land use. Uh, well, as we've been built out and as we've lost uh, redevelopment agencies and many of our traditional tools, 
Um, I've talked to, as an economic development director, I've talked to many, many policymakers, finance directors, city managers, uh, and other economic development directors who are asking this question, uh, what do we do now? How, what role do we play in the economy? Where do we have levers to pull? And, and how do we catalyze economic uh, activity that is both beneficial for the city, uh, meaning City Hall, as well as beneficial for the people, the residents, the, the workers, investors, and entrepreneurs in our city? And so we're going to go through a few of those levers that you can pull. And uh, ultimately, we're trying to, to, to share strategies that don't cost you uh, much money. We know that bigger cities uh, may have more resources to work with. They also have uh, larger expenses and challenges. Uh, but smaller cities um, have a lot that they can do for very little money, very little investment. Um, but it, it, it takes a little bit different uh, perspective on how to go about economic development. So first and foremost, so uh, knowing your history is the absolute place to start. Who are you? What are your assets? What have been the traditional industries and sectors that have driven your um, economic opportunity? So you sit in a region, you sit um, in a, uh, a, an environment where you may have something unique and different when it comes to everything from anchor institutions, um, geographic proximity, even transportation infrastructure that has been built in and around you. And of course, Long Beach, uh, waterfront, port town, uh, built airports, built freeways, we've leveraged a lot of our geographic as well as uh, some of our um, uh, sort of just baked in um, assets to develop industries around uh, our, our geographic position in the region, but we've had to change. Um, the second piece is, is uh, starting with who you are, know what you are and grow what you are. Um, you build a strategic plan around uh, your uh, regional strengths as well as your historical strengths. Uh, so this is not about everybody trying to be Silicon Valley. This is not about anybody in the region even trying to be, uh, you know, Santa Monica, Playa Vista, or, um, you know, Irvine. Uh, this is about knowing what we are and growing what we are and being very deliberate about that. So the city of Long Beach about three years ago uh, adopted um, uh, a strategic plan for economic development called the Blueprint. It's online. I can share it later. Um, but it, it really uh, was 24 community-based meetings with all of our industry leaders uh, from those major sectors, as well as community leaders um, in our neighborhoods to talk about everything from uh, workforce development to real estate development. The other thing is, is that it's, it's really uh, gra grounding your economic philosophy as well as your strategy in data. Um, Nick Schultz, who's on this call, he's going to be talking in just a moment, is our you know, city expert on economic data, um, workforce employment data, trends. Um, but we also uh, turn to partners at our university, uh, the University of Cal State Long Beach, of course. Um, sometimes we've actually had to pay for some um, economic research as well to interpret this data. Um, but you uh, need to know your data. You need to be able, because uh, in, in economic development, there's a lot of people that stand to benefit financially uh, by influencing your policymakers. Um, typically, the businesses uh, that have the ear of the council, the investors who have the ear of the council, uh, the unions, it could be uh, business associations. Uh, typically, there's a lot of misinformation in oral tradition. There's, there's many um, misidentified uh, mis, mis, uh, um, uh, information about your economy, where the opportunities are, that is constantly being thrown at your policymakers. And so uh, we found that uh, people didn't know, even our policymakers didn't know a lot about the actual data, the actual uh, economic uh, trends that were going on within uh, the city of Long Beach. They had a lot of oral tradition about who we were, what we were, and um, we were able to um, uh, kind of pull back the curtain by grounding that in data. And we were able to fend off, uh, using both the sword and the shield, uh, fend off a lot of misnomers and misinformation uh, that was being um, shoved on, on, on our uh, policymakers uh, because of um, just historical uh, and competitive uh, interests. Um, the other thing that, that we've, we, we have an incredible, incredible um, opportunity and, and advantage in Southern California in particular, but this is the same in California generally. 
whether you're small, whether you're medium, whether you're large, um, the regional economies, um, the incredible infrastructure in, in the state of California. You hear a lot of people complaining about it falling apart and it's, it's, a, it's you know, uh, third world quality infrastructure. Um, that's actually um, not true. Uh, we have incredible, incredible infrastructure that states all over this country would die to have. Um, that infrastructure is uh, both physical, it's about transportation infrastructure, it's about geographic proximity uh, to, to international markets. Uh, that has been built over, um, you know, a hundred years and, and, and trillions of dollars have been poured into this infrastructure. Uh, it needs uh, maintenance, it needs reinvestment. Um, that is true. That is absolutely true that we're not investing enough in the continual care and feeding of our infrastructure. Um, but also higher education. Uh, we have the most robust, uh, the largest in terms of volume as well as quality. Uh, it's a higher learning system producing talent um, uh, for, for, for employers. Um, in the country um, uh, and in some cases the world uh, through our, our, our infrastructure. And that makes us uh, really, really powerful as, as regional, uh, as, as individual parts of a much, much bigger regional uh, economic opportunity. Yeah, just as an example, um, with, with roughly a $3 trillion GDP in the state of California, um, you hear this all the time, but we are the fifth largest uh, uh, economy as a nation uh, worldwide. Uh, we also, uh, just as an example, uh, in LA, and, and this is, I'm talking about Long Beach a little bit right now, but um, there is $1 trillion of that GDP just in LA and Orange County. So just two counties uh, in Southern California represent $1 trillion of gross uh, domestic product. That means um, resources, opportunity for workers, investors, entrepreneurs, uh, as well as cities. Um, and, and we're all a part of it. We all play a different role. So we really need to think more regionally in terms of economic opportunity because um, we can't do it within our own city boundaries. That even includes the, the, the big gorilla, the 500 uh, square mile city of Los Angeles. They are also sitting within a regional economy that is much, much bigger uh, than just the city alone. And all of the smaller and midsize and even Long Beach included as a smaller city within this mega region have tremendous opportunity to partner, collaborate, and think regionally. That number on the right, you'll see that pie chart, that little Pac-Man, 77% of our residents actually drive outside the borders of the city of Long Beach for work each day. What, what's happening is that they're making more money by chasing economic opportunity in the region. Uh, they love to live here, great community, half a million people in Long Beach, they love living here, but they can actually make more money uh, by uh, chasing uh, higher wages or maybe business opportunities, investment opportunities uh, regionally than they can just by trying to do all of their business inside the city boundaries. So we have to think regionally and we have to think about regional mobility. Um, the greatest economic opportunity for most cities is actually not in, inside the city 100%. It's actually by connecting our residents, our businesses, our investors, uh, in, in, into the regional um, uh, economy. So that's why we're going to talk a lot about uh, high, high, infra uh, high tech infrastructure, um, mobility infrastructure, public transportation, um, our ports. Um, so, so shifting gears, we're going to talk about real estate development, business development, and workforce development today. I would say that you're most familiar uh, with real estate development. Most economic development directors are, most finance directors are, most city managers are. Um, but I think I'm saving the best for last because workforce development, I think, is the, the X factor. That's the secret that so many of us, and I'll admit myself, um, are, are not as aware of as an incredible, incredible driver of economic opportunity, of business attraction. It's the secret weapon that we have in California. So uh, starting with real estate development, I'm going to zip through this. Uh, innovation district. So can't do, uh, can't do real estate project areas anymore, can't do TIF through, through RDA, oh well. Um, under the state law now, we have the opportunity for enhanced infrastructure financing districts, EIFDs. There's a number of cities um, that are partnering with their counties now to do specific plans, business plans, and create uh, enhanced infrastructure financing districts. You can do uh, TIFs uh, through that vehicle now. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a process, it's a bit unfamiliar, uh, 12 to 18 months, maybe, depending on where you sit and in which county you're sitting in, how close you are. Uh, the county of LA, as an example, passed a policy at the um, county level, Board of Supervisors, um, to participate in EIFDs with cities. 
Um, and this is a huge, huge opportunity for us to, to, to now leverage these partnerships. Creation of an EIFD signals to investors and developers. It also signals to um, uh, businesses to, to locate because there's going to be uh, debt uh, by uh, cities um, to, to do public uh, infrastructure uh, enhancements, whether it's transportation enhancements, uh, whether it's some sort of open space or, or uh, smart cities enhancements. Um, EIFDs are a great opportunity for you um, to partner with your counties in cost sharing and to leverage debt to do uh, economic development projects. Um, High-tech infrastructure, this is a major one. Uh, you saw Long Beach, you know, we've always had ports. Whoever had a port, you know, they attracted commerce, they attracted uh, economic activity. Then we build our rails. Our rails move goods around the region uh, and into the country. Um, and then we built airports and then we built highways. Um, so we've always been building uh, transportation infrastructure to move goods and workers around our, our economies and around our regions. Now um, it's about high tech infrastructure. US cities and economic development directors, finance directors, city managers, you have to have a fiber master plan. How are you building the infrastructure to move uh, people, ideas, goods, and services around uh, your city as well as around the region? What is your plan for connecting every single business, every single household? In addition to building the, the infrastructure, because that's a real estate thing. Um, that will enable uh, private sector businesses, small or big, to come in and build on top of your uh, fiber, you know, on top of your, your, your infrastructure. Um, you have to also look at your strategies for what we call digital inclusion. You can do this through partnerships. Uh, digital inclusion, there are nonprofits, there are for-profit telecommunications, fiber owners that are willing to partner on you. You control permitting, you control land use, you control a lot of the cost drivers for them to trench or to put in infrastructure for um, uh, fiber, uh, broadband access and those things for businesses, residents, workers, et cetera. Um, you have a lot of opportunity here, but you need to, you need to partner up. You need to have a plan and you need to work with the private sector to build out that plan. The other thing about real estate development in terms of public private partnerships is that, um, there are a lot of models now that, um, you know, have, have existed in one form or fashion. Uh, but have become much more robust. So the city of LA uh, is exploring this, I think, for their civic center right now. The city of Long Beach just finished a half billion dollar civic center uh, project, new city hall, new port headquarters, uh, new libraries, new parks. These are through very, very creative design, build, finance operations and maintain uh, DDFOMs. These are complicated structures of risk transfer, of investment um, uh, sharing, but um, public-private partnerships are a real opportunity um, particularly as we enter a recession. There's a lot of capital out there, whether it's private equity, venture capital, institutional investment. They're looking for really, really solid, reliable returns. They may be long-term returns. They may be smaller returns, but, but um, partnering with a government agency to build core infrastructure is something that the private sector investment community is looking to do. I'm not saying everybody, because some people need 8.5%, some people need 6%. Some people may only need uh, three and a half to four percent over 40 years as part of their investment portfolio. They're willing to build your infrastructure for you, lease it back to you um, over that 40 year term. You may be even able to lower your operating costs on aging infrastructure. Long Beach built this entire project. There's another half billion dollar uh, private residential project coming in as part of the Civic Center. And um, this actually uh, was done without any new taxes, no debt. Um, and uh, allowed for a catalytic project that is now um, take, taken a major bite out of the downtown market in terms of risk and has attracted more private sector uh, construction as a result. Um, so I'm gonna switch to business development. So this is a, also an interesting one because um, our role as City Hall traditionally has not been to play a role in private sector business development. Now, business attraction using our real estate, throwing incentives at people, revenue sharing on sales tax, whatever. But business development has not been an area that City Hall really understands, nor um, does the private sector typically want us meddling in. Um, you know, get out of our way, just lower, uh, lower the regulations, lower the permitting, lower the licensing fees. Well, that's not enough. That really is not enough in a high cost environment like Southern California, California in general. Um, California is attractive to a lot of, of companies and we still see the California economy growing. We see business attraction. Um, we're still leading in total numbers um, 
of job uh, growth, of, of business growth. The problem is that you also have uh, in this high cost environment, uh, a need for other supports to help businesses navigate this high cost, high risk, high reward type of business investment environment. So uh, we learned early on that we have a very small business development shop. You may look at Long Beach and go, wow, it's, it's half a million people. It's such a big city. I have two full-time people working on business development, two, two. And one of them is dedicated to managing our business improvement district program. Uh, another one is managing a lot of our loan programs and serving as a navigator to businesses to get through the licensing and permitting process. I have two people. So I want you to know that you have to, you can do a lot with very little. Uh, navigational tools, creating um, a, a one-stop shop for businesses to understand how to do permitting and licensing and everything. This code that uh, we built for Bizport is actually free. It's available. Uh, you can go and download this code. You can tweak it. Uh, to put your own spin, your own colors, your own content, uh, and you can and you can launch it yourself. In fact, the city of Minneapolis did that. They took our code and they launched their own site uh, for free using our Bizport um, open source code. Um, capital access. Some people think, hey, city halls should not be playing the role of lending. The banks will do that. Well, guess what? The banks will do that for people with certain levels of credit. And right now, even though interest rates are zero, uh, credit is hard to get for very small businesses. It's, it's almost impossible to get for startups. And so you can play a really important role in capital access for the, the portion or the, the market that the commercial lenders do not want to touch. Um, they have underwriting standards. They're not going to loan to startups, um, to, 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 to entrepreneurs that represent a high risk uh, for, for repayment. So we have found, um, as an example, we, we have now partnered with a nonprofit a uh, crowdfunding um, uh, uh, a platform called Kiva. We've now done over $225,000 in loans. Um, and guess who the lenders are? The lenders are members of the Long Beach community uh, who loaned to these 25 businesses uh, who got 10,000 each. They started their businesses and helped them to grow. We've also partnered with the Economic Development Administration, the EDA. They are actually um, uh, partnering with counties and cities to put um, grants into revolving loan funds. Again, we have a 2.4% uh, interest rate on that. It's basically prime plus one. It pays for the administration of the loans. Uh, we just got done doing 70 of these loans, uh, COVID-related emergency relief. Uh, they have seven-year repayments. These businesses will only have to pay $150 a month uh, starting uh, next year. So we've created, um, a, a, we filled a gap in the market for capital access for a lot of the very small businesses that cannot get uh, uh, loans from the commercial lenders. Um, your university for business development is your uh, gold mine, gold mine, and it doesn't have to be in your town. If you're a small city, uh, you're, you're maybe a couple miles away from um, the next college or university, um, it doesn't matter. You, you need to reach out to your university, and that includes the business school, the design school, uh, it could be College of Engineering. Your university is one of your major, major pipelines for talent and a major attractant for employers. I will say this, Long Beach is emerging as a hub or a cluster. Uh, we just had our fourth um, rocket launch company, uh, you know, aerospace manufacturer for, for building rockets to take satellites to space. The fourth one uh, has landed just in the last three years. And the thing that they cite more than anything, and I take them on tours to the university to visit the engineering college. The Dean of Engineering, Forzan Galshani, has met with every one of them and their talent, uh, their talent leads um, because what they need most is very expensive, highly, highly skilled um, and highly trained talent. They need that for the next 50 years. So they have to go to places where they can get talent. We have also started a, a university partnership for business development called the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. That's the slide. Uh, that, it, it only uh, cost us about $25,000 for the first year for an internship. And then after the, the organization got going on campus, we have on a daily basis interaction with the Director of in, uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the campus um, who connects us to different schools, resources, grants. We partner on everything. And they have become a big, big uh, player in the entrepreneurial support. They do training. They do workshops, um, et cetera, that help to boost our entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, the last thing is, 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 what does that mean, entrepreneurial ecosystem? So City Hall can, it should not be writing business plans for people. City Hall should not be picking winner, winners or losers. City Hall should be uh, 
engaging with private sector partners, educational institutions, and putting together, whether it's by the creating of nonprofits or attracting um, what are called ecosystem builders. These are the incubators, the accelerators. Uh, it may just be that you provide uh, an underutilized uh, physical space. I've got one of those down on Pine Avenue that is going to be uh, a new incubator. Um, use what you have and use uh, your partnerships to put together um, uh, the information, the opportunity. It could be physical space. It could be technical training. Um, your small business development centers that are funded by the federal government. Your goal is to put together entrepreneurial ecosystem support programs. Here's a new nonprofit we launched in town called the Tech Accelerator. Uh, that is a board of local uh, legal um, uh, accounting, um, some, some entrepreneurs, um, some investors. All we did was convene as the city. And you don't necessarily have to be the one who funds it. You have to be the one, uh, though, that convenes and facilitates the connections between people uh, to create it. So I'm going to shift gears. Um, Nick Schultz is our executive director for Pacific Gateway, which is a regional workforce agency. Um, he's an amazing resource to you. Uh, and he's going to tell you about the world of workforce development. I'll just say one last thing. I had no idea how this, this all works until Nick taught me. Um, and I believe that city hall, city managers, we do not, when we go to our you know, colleges and our PA programs, we don't learn enough about how the workforce development world works and how important it is to attracting businesses uh, uh, and, and helping them grow in our city. So, Nick? Okay. Thank you, John, for, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm talk to you uh, a little bit about um, our, our federal workforce development system um, that is actually uh, deployed locally. Um, hope to tell you a little bit about the, the value we add to the economic development efforts uh, here in, in Long Beach and hopefully push you in the right direction to get connected um, with your local board and um, their toolkit of available resources because they are there in all of your communities um, to work in partnership and 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 support uh, the business community with you uh, whether you're aware of that or not so very very quickly and very briefly um, your local workforce development board um, is designated to serve a, a set area through federal legislation. Um, they are governed uh, in partnership with the chief local elected official of a specific jur jurisdiction who then appoints um, at, at a minimum a 19 member board of directors. That board of directors is the majority private sector. And then there are is a required uh, labor representation as well as other service delivery partners in the area. And one of those required service delivery partners in the area is economic development. So in every jurisdiction, economic development has a seat at the table. If you don't know regionally or locally uh, who's in that seat, um, I would suggest it would benefit you greatly uh, to find out, um, engage with them or engage about the availability of that seat if it's not properly uh, represented uh, with, within your jurisdiction. Um, all, of, all of the boards uh, across the state of California, and there are 46 of them, um, all of the boards have a core allocation of, of federal money. Uh, and that federal money uh, does really four things. Um, it serves disconnected youth, um, so those who are not currently in um, education or, or employment activity. Uh, it serves un, underemployed or never employed adults to enter the workforce. And it interacts with everybody who's been laid off, lost the job, and interacts with the state's uh, unemployment compensation system to get re-entrained or rapidly reattached to employment. So, um, so that sounds very participant or individual focused. Um, where you have to understand um, that's not the case is the fact that 
all those funds continue to come and are doled out to local boards because they meet performance metrics. And all of those performance metrics are associated with employment. So those programs I just talked about for you are actually judged by their labor force attachment rate, the retention in the labor force of those participants, and the increased earnings over time of, of those folks who continue to retain and advance in the labor force. So I say all that to say, we can't do our jobs in workforce development unless we understand who our business is, what the needs of that business core customer is, and without them willing to source folks from, from our participant pool. So the other thing your local board is required to do and should do very well is not only produce um, local employment data, they have access to confidential employment data through the state employment development department that other folks cannot access. Um, they should synthesize that and present it in a way that's digestible, not only to economic development, but educational stakeholders and the general uh, job seeking public uh, in, in your local area. So if you're not connected with them um, in how that um, data is, is again sourced and produced, um, you should definitely be involved in that conversation. You're a key stakeholder um, as, as are the businesses that, that you interact with. And the other thing is um, data is great, but it's, it's a snapshot or a clue about what's going on, um, how things move on the ground, um, how local dynamics shift and what individual businesses need is only achieved um, by convening those businesses and, and asking them. So your, your boards should know what the primary drivers or sector of your local economy are. They should have advisory committees related to each of those key drivers. And those committees should have representative samples of who your individual industries or businesses are um, within your jurisdiction. Uh, talking to them uh, about the data, interpreting for them, and talking about specifically um, how they benefit or, or strategies to, to benefit them uh, based on those uh, forecasts or, or data points. Um, and I see John has put up for us um, what the uh, individual jurisdictions are in the, um, in the state. Uh, you can find that at the California Workforce Association's website. You can also uh, find the, the contact information for my counterparts or, or who your local directors are there. So what do we do and, and, and how do we su support economic development specifically? Well, in, in Long Beach, we, we, we know some key things. Um, we know um, based on both the uh, pandemic and the uh, civil unrest that, that's happened over the past uh, 13 or, or so weeks, that, that we've seen roughly 71,000 folks have to um, move to the unemployment rolls as their primary source of income. Uh, we, we also know that, um, like no other time in history, that, that the feds have supplemented um, unemployment income um, at, at at a really unprecedented level, an extra $600 a week. So we look at that, at those 71,000 folks and those $600 extra that the federal government's providing to them as another $43 million of, of income that's coming on into the city of Long Beach um, on, a weekly, on a weekly basis. And what do we do in conjunction with, with economic development and the downturn that we've seen um, to get people comfortable and engaged in, in spending that money uh, in their city in, in a confident way. Um, so we're, we're doing that. Um, we've put together a, a great list of, of resources um, that, are, that are available to those folks uh, to let them know that we're not only here to support them as, as they make their transition, 
But at the same point in time, we have, we have businesses that are hiring and knowing what their skill set is, um, what, what their talents, what their knowledge is, that we can rapidly connect them to, to reemployment um, if they've, um, <clears throat> if, if that's their desire at, at this point in time. So we're, we're serving both, both those purposes. Um, in, interesting fact, um, in, in December of last year, um, the Harvard Economic Review estimated the knowledge and skills of the American workforce at $240 trillion, uh, the, the value. That's four times more than the on-hand capital stock of the United States. And it's 10 times more value than all the urban developed land in, in, in the United States. You have a resource in your community that can immediately tap into and help you reposition your community's share of that $240 trillion in, in real time, in real time. So we do that in the ways I've described. We also augment a lot of the efforts of the, the economic um, development team here in the city. John talked about business development. I have a three times as large business in engagement team. And most of that business engagement team is focused on immediate talent development needs uh, with, with our key industries and employers. But we've been able to use that consistent presence of that team to bring back uh, key intelligence um, to our economic uh, de development organization about where they have the opportunity um, to, to invest in or incentivize, incentivize growth in a way that's, that's common or complementary to not only our key industries, um, but helps optimize uh, their supply chain. Um, there's some fantastic work we've done over the years. Um, John mentioned our, our pride um, in the uh, aerospace defense cluster and how we've transitioned from a former really uh, defense manufacturing community uh, to a uh, commercial uh, aerospace uh, juggernaut. And uh, a lot of that work was done through workforce development uh, when our C-17 um, defense facility uh, went down. Uh, our master plan is a good look at that and the <clears throat> economic transition that's uh, largely landed Long Beach uh, on its feet over the last four or five years. I could, I could talk quite a bit more about some of our efforts and how it's interwoven with and supports uh, economic development all the, all the way down to um, localizing and uh, flattening uh, gig work platforms um, to allow our uh, intermittent workforce uh, more access to uh, opportunity and, and hours right here in our own city and region, uh, but I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh, open it up for questions. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see our website and uh, some, of the, some of the things we do and our efforts in a little more depth and uh, how we support and uh, help grow our local business in line with uh, the city's economic development objectives. Great. Well, we are going to put up, John, we're going to put up how to ask questions slide. Is that the end? Do you have any more yep. slides? Okay, I'm going to get out of there for you. Oh, I'm sorry. I did. Um, I, oh, go I, ahead. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to just wrap up with um, a little bit about some affordable ways that our cities can also engage um, with their business community, with uh, their business leaders, um, how they can engage with uh, investors and developers. Uh, without putting, you know, a ton of money uh, into it or having a big staff. So I'll just wrap up with communication. So, so one of the most affordable things you can do these days, um, and it's mainly because of electronic communications, social media, websites, et cetera, is um, we've been able to have a tremendous impact by only, only using a part-time uh, FTE. So um, in, in, 
our shop, as I mentioned, we don't have a lot of resources, but we're able to have a big presence. We're able to have a daily presence um, because we're leveraging um, online um, communications. Um, we created at the beginning of COVID-19, as an example, uh, a hotline, uh, 5704Biz, um, so that businesses who are struggling with issues could call in. Now, we, we staffed that up initially with Parks and Rec employees because we didn't have any staff to do this. Um, but during an emergency, we, they, they were not allowed to do business, so they came over, we trained them up, they answered phones. My point uh, for the smaller cities is that um, even just establishing a hotline for businesses uh, to help them navigate all these complexities, because they don't know what questions to ask, they don't what, know what number to call, um, but to establish a presence of a, of a, of a four biz phone number, a four biz email, a four biz website uh, is very powerful. We also have been using constant contact on a weekly basis. Now, just once a week, um, we've been partnering with our financial management business licensing group to, to reach out to about 10,000 businesses uh, per week on some of the bigger issues that uh, programs, this could be federal programs, it could be regional grants, it could be anything that is business related that is going to impact opening, closing, uh, accessing capital, those things that we talked about. And your, your constant contact uh, subscription is, is probably uh, 40 bucks a month. Um, so it does take time. One, one of your staff members has to be uh, digesting this content and putting it up and, and you have to maintain your list. Another affordable way to have a relationship with your businesses. We found that we were just sending them a business license renewal bill once a year. That was all they were getting from us. And so we needed to change that dynamic and start uh, providing value through uh, that. Another way that we've been doing it, uh, a very affordable way, is through daily business briefs. So we have a staff member, um, he's a, he does a great job at this, um, but again, he's one of the two people that we have on business development who is putting together um, usually one or two key resources that are available to clarify something. It might be about a, a health order or a county rule or a new program in the city. Um, it could be something that is, you know, uh, a grant provided by a private foundation or a webinar put on by our regional sm small business development center. So your daily business briefs create a, uh, uh, an ongoing communication stream. It's not very expensive. It just um, requires that you repackage information that's already out there. That's all this is. Um, and you could even get on our business brief uh, 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 list and then you can just repackage our information. I know other cities are doing that. They're just grabbing the Long Beach business brief and they're reposting it. So it, it provides a lot of easy value. Um, and then your websites and social media. So this just is an example that we've had to up, make updates to our website pretty much every 48 hours uh, since the COVID-19, 12 weeks ago since we declared an emergency because information has been changing. However, we also have found that this is like a, an archive. It's, a, it's an artifact. It's something that people can go back to. Uh, this is longbeach.gov slash 4biz. They can click on that. They can see the most recent things. We continually clean the website um, and make it easier for the businesses to find resources across other agencies. So as an example, a business owner in the state of California who is opening a restaurant with entertainment may have to interact, at least in Long Beach, with 26 different um, uh, permits and licenses, and that means they interact with 12 different agencies. So we try to clean that up. Software is all about removing complexity. So we try to clean that up by uh, curating the website, cleaning those, those links for them and putting them all in one place. And then storytelling. It is, you know, uh, an affordable way to really um, uh, to, to help people, to educate people, to, to create a community is through storytelling. And we do that in a couple of different ways. I try to engage the media. I send cool stories to the media. Um, we're not afraid of the media. In fact, we love the media because they will focus on small businesses that, are, uh, that have great stories. Um, and uh, we in particular like to share stories where the businesses have interacted with government and tapped into programs that they value. Um, and then the media does all the content creation for you. Um, it's called uh, earned media instead of bought media. So I, I recommend that you, you, you tap somebody also in your organization who's really good at storytelling just to feature and highlight those uh, business uh, businesses, those entrepreneurs, those developers, those investors, because guess what? It's free advertising for them. They will love you if you introduce them to the media and the media does an article about them and suddenly their business picks up because people in the community love their story 
and you didn't have to spend a penny uh, actually writing the content. The, the, the staff writer did because they wanted some good content. So in any case, I, I just really encourage you to think about storytelling and about your community, your economy, because the economy is, is confusing, it's weird, there's all kinds of misinformation out there. Um, and, and economic development directors are storytellers. They need to be able uh, to highlight uh, the things that are important and, and people really appreciate when they're, they're recognized and they're valued. So with that, I will shut up and uh, we'll answer some questions. If, if uh, Megan, you wanna read some off to us? Yes, so we're gonna get up our how to ask a question slide. But before we do that, John, you said um, you, do produ you do produce that business brief and that cities can borrow some of your content. Yep. How do they sign up for that webinar or that uh, email? Yeah, so I, I think as a starting point for today, um, it, it, they can just send it to me. They can, they can type uh, 4biz, that's the number 4, B-I-Z, at longbeach.gov. Um, so it's just 4biz at longbeach.gov. And just say, hey, add me to a daily business brief or add me to your, your distribution. And then feel free, you'll, you'll see most of, those, most of those announcements in those emails are actually about federal and state programs. They're about workforce programs, county programs. Uh, you don't have to come up with original content. You just have to be that maven, that aggregator, clean it up, make it simple, user-friendly with links to, to help them get started. Um, you also don't have to bring in private capital, as Nick said. His agency is bringing in over $40 million a week to Long Beach households. That's bigger than any investor. That's bigger than any private sector investor in this community. $40 million a week. Who's employing that many people putting that many dollars into Long Beach households? So you, you, can, you can do things in, in really new and creative ways. No, and you also talked about how economic development directors are storytellers and are uh, working with the media to tell these stories. How hard is it to sell these, um, these business stories to our media? Oh my God, they love them. They absolutely, there's nothing that Americans love more than their, their entrepreneurs. They absolutely love the story of somebody taking a risk putting it all on the line and succeeding. And they love it when they get to see not only a good role model, um, uh, whether they're residents that want to support that business, whether it's other businesses that want to learn from that business, or it's staff writers that are looking for clickbait. They want people to click on their stories. And the business owner themselves love it because they get an opportunity for free advertising. So it's a virtuous um, you know, uh, circle of, 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 of positivity. So. Um, I think it's knowing your business owners is critical, uh, knowing them, getting to know their stories, that's your job, and then sharing them. And your policymakers love it when that business owner says, you know what, the city has been really supportive of me, not only getting to know me, but also to share my stories uh, with uh, the, the local media. And the council loves that because they know that you know the community and that you're lifting them up. So both John and Nick have provided a ton of great information. There are two ways to ask questions. One is written in the Q&A box and one is a verbal question. You just raise your hand and we will call on you. Um, this video and information will be on the league's website at cities dot org backslash coronavirus. We know that um, there's been so much good information. It's difficult to write it down. Um, and John, that email address is the number 4biz at cityoflongbeach.gov, correct? I'm sorry, I'll type it into the chat right now. Perfect. Um, but it's just longbeach.gov. So 4biz at longbeach.gov. Yeah, and, and I'll let them know that, hey, there's going to probably be a couple emails coming in just to add to the daily business brief, add to the, the, the weekly email blast, um, and, and so they'll get you going right away. Perfect. Um, just going through, you did mention, what is DFOM stand for? All right, I'll type it in, but it's design, build, finance, operate, and maintain. Uh, a DBFOM is, is a structure for um, building and, um, you know, designing, building, financing, operating, maintaining um, real estate. Uh, it's been used in Europe a lot, um, but it's an all-in. It involves probably five, six, maybe even seven partners. 
um, and it's it's complicated. But the good news is is that Long Beach did the biggest one in the nation for a municipal P3 private public private partnership. So the model's there. I can even share with you the 125 page council letter that put the 16 individual agreements in place between the agencies that, that put the deal together. So we're either going to be a, a huge success. I mean, I'm standing in the new city hall right now, um, or, you know, years from now, everybody's going to say we're idiots, but at least, you know, somebody's already done it and uh, we can provide you with the, the, the path forward. That's great. Do all counties have a workforce development board? So the, the short answer is yes. The, a little more detail. Um, we're not necessarily organized at the county level. So some workforce development board, boards serve an entire county. Some workforce development boards uh, serve a city or a collection of cities under a, a joint powers agreement. Uh, some serve multi-counties. Uh, but there is a local workforce development board that represents every jurisdiction in the state of California. Great. What are your thoughts on city loan programs versus city partnering with banks and or EDAs? Okay, I'm looking at it real quick. Um, it's the number one question at 1141. What are your thoughts on city uh, loan programs versus city partnering with banks. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's, I think it's, and I think it's both. Um, yeah. 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 So, so something that we have discovered, so going back 30 years, going back to the 1992 civil unrest, um, uh, we secured our very, very first $1 million grant from the federal government for rebuilding the parts of the community in Long Beach that were destroyed uh, from um, the looting and vandalism that occurred after the LA riots. Those were very, very small businesses that banks would not lend to. Um, they had, usually they were renting, so they had no assets to collateralize. Usually they didn't have strong personal credit. That's why they were very, very small businesses to begin with. They didn't have inventory. They didn't have a strong business plan or cash flow. They couldn't meet any of the key underwriting standards that banks require. And, and again, if you talk to a bank, they're going to say, We'd like to loan to the, these very small businesses, but uh, you know our underwriter won't allow it. And we have these underwriting policies that our boards have, have, have adopted. And so I wish we could, but we can't. The other thing is, is that the banks, if they do, if you can get them to come to the table, they say, you know what, we'll do that if you guarantee these loans 100%. So we'll loan out a million dollars of capital to these very small businesses if you put up a million dollar loan loss reserve to guarantee that if a, if a loan fails, you'll reimburse us 100% for those losses. So, you know, guarantees, um, you know, credit enhancements, um, there's all kinds of different programs out there. Even the federal government right now in the Main Street Loan Program that's rolling out this week, the Main Street Loan Program is the first time that the Treasury uh, has actually participated. Um, they're going to be buying 95% of the loans that these banks are going to be uh, offering to uh, medium-sized businesses across the country. They're going to be buying 95%. They're not even providing a guarantee. They're going to buy the loan package up to 95%, depending on which program that people use under Main Street. So the challenge is, is that banks are for-profit. The banks are generally, um, have to meet certain underwriting standards that they've either adopted or whatever. And they're not going to typically provide cities with very good terms. Um, and so what we found after the, the, the unrest in 92, we, we got our first grant of a million dollars. We've now made $10 million in loans, very small loans. I mean, these are $10,000, $25,000 loans. We've made uh, $10 million of loans over 30 years to hundreds of small businesses that would not be able to access credit through commercial banks. We have also found we only had an 8% loan loss. So we've actually performed better in many cases than uh, a lot of the commercial bank programs because we've also partnered in our revolving loan fund, RLF, the revolving loan fund with the EDA. We partner up with the Small Business Development Center. And those free business consultants are a requirement of our borrowers. So they hold their hands in business planning, not only to package the financials to submit the loan application to us, but also in the repayment. 
And the last thing is, is that um, you, another advantage of not partnering with, with banks on these um, is that we have a local loan committee who's part of our you know, appointed economic development commission. That loan committee, when a business goes through a period of hardship, could uh, modify the terms and conditions of the repayment at the local level. So if we know that we've got a business that has some interruption, some sort of downturn, whatever, we could give them a, a three month grace period where, where maybe interest still accrues, but they can defer repayment for that period of time without going into default. So there's, there's a lot of things that uh, these government backed programs can do strategically, especially in the particular, you know, the, the, the targeted approach to certain sectors or demographic geographic areas of your city that you're trying to kickstart, but don't represent a good return on cost for the commercial banks. Wow, those are impressive numbers. Out of all the businesses Long Beach has reached out to, how many have actually received the financial assistance? Did you say that number? Yeah, yeah. So, so in the last uh, eight weeks, um, we did 70 loans. We got, I think, 92 applications, um, requests for COVID relief. These were all businesses that couldn't get SBA or PPP or some of the other big federal loans. They couldn't get loans from uh, commercial banks. Um, so we did, uh, we've, we funded 70 of them in, in the last uh, roughly two months. Um, we've got about 10 more that we're processing now. And the cool thing is um, that because we've lent out now almost, we have commitments on 100% of our existing revolving loan fund. That was what we had as balance. We had about 800,000 of that original million sitting there that we said, we're getting 100% on the street today. Well, lo and behold, three weeks ago, EDA gets through the Federal CARES Act funding they got a $1.5 billion allocation from Congress. So the regional EDA comes to us and says, hey, we love what you guys have been doing. We're gonna give you the opportunity to, to uh, submit for a non-competitive grant of $2.4 million to recapitalize your revolving loan fund. So it was like, you know, manna from heaven, the, the federal government came in and said, you guys have been doing a great job with this. Since you've put 100% of your dollars out on the street, we want you to apply for another uh, revolving loan fund um, grant. And, and they did that and we did that. And so we're hoping within the next week or two, we're not only gonna have that original 800,000, they tripled it. They said, you're one of our fastest, most effective lenders. So we're gonna triple your, your loan fund, um, not 800. Now we're gonna give you 2.4 and see if you can do that. Because remember, we just did relief loans. Mm -hmm. We're now starting the transition period. The next 90 days for all of us is gonna be about economic transition as businesses start to reopen. So what kind of capital do they need in that period? And then once that 90 days is over, what does the economic recovery strategy look like? That's gonna be completely different once the governor allows the economy to reopen fully. Yeah, the other thing I would add to that um, with regards to finan financial assistance, but not necessarily uh, thinking, thinking about a loan is we've been able to step in as workforce, um, leveraging um, our dollars and, and our programs and just be able to work some folks through through the slowdown with work share or subsidize wages for their employees so so they can remain open continue to make payroll uh, people can continue to go to work earn an income those types of things so folks who weren't in a position or were worried about a loan we've we've had some other re financial resources um, to support them um, so that they didn't have to go that route so a part of those 70 businesses, 10 more in the queue, what kind of businesses have they been? Yeah. So, so um, the, as, you, as you all know, um, the, the majority and on, on a percentage basis of businesses that were negatively impacted by COVID, non-essential and otherwise have been in uh, retail and, 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 and services, particularly when it comes to um, non-essential retail um, and services like, um, you know, health, personal grooming, um, that kind of stuff. So gyms, barbershops, salons, et cetera. So we've seen a lot in that locally serving retail sector. Um, and of course, entertainment and hospitality. Anybody that's connected to our visitor serving attractions um, or uh, attractions for business travel, like our convention center, anybody who makes money from large events or is even in the supply chain for large events has, has really suffered. Nick, um, and so that's, that's where our loans are going. Nick, uh, who else has been submitting the most warn notices or seeing the most uh, layoffs? Yeah, so, so you hit it. Obvi obviously, uh, 
hospitality, retail, tourism, um, those, those have been the most impacted um, because of the continuance of, of health orders, but those are starting to relax. Uh, the other things that we've seen happen, we, we've seen um, in some segments, sub, sub, sub segments of manufacturing, um, we, we've seen us, we've seen a slowdown. Um, our, you know, our, our port related industries, especially if, if they're not involved in, in export, uh, there's, there's been a related slowdown. And, and of course, the, the professional and technical services that support both uh, manufacturing and trade transportation and logistics. Have, have slowed a bit. So for a small city, uh, do you, what do you recommend regarding a shift from brick and mortar to online sales? Yeah, no, I, I love that. So the, the reason we, we kind of tried to throw a bunch of different slides at you is because you can, you can kind of pick and choose the, the group. So num number one, number one, think about who in the private sector wants the world to go online. So you need, to, you need to get a relationship going with your telecommunications companies. So these are the groups that provide internet service uh, to businesses. Start talking to their regional director, public affairs director about, hey, my community, uh, I need to get my businesses online. I need to get my businesses connected, whether it's um, you know, just the, the, the actual uh, hard connection, whether it's uh, hardware, to use, um, whether it's point of sale systems or it's, um, you know, the hardware that they're going to need to, to, to manage um, uh, those online transactions. And then it's uh, the training. So we call it digital literacy. So start with your telecommunications companies, um, you know, whether it's Verizon or AT&T or uh, it could be Frontier. It could also be the fiber owners like Crown Castle. We formed a strategic partnership agreement as well as a digital inclusion. Um, we call it our digital inclusion roadmap. There's a, there's, a, there's a committee um, that involves our school districts, our, uh, some business owners, nonprofits who provide hardware for free, uh, Human IT as an example, uh, as well as Verizon and the telecommunications and Crown Castle and the fiber owners. But we've brought them all together on a, a digital inclusion committee. And, and all you would need is four or five people that become your kitchen cabinet on, on digital literacy, digital connectivity. And then we did a strategic partnership agreement with Verizon in particular, because we wanted to share some of our fiber. They wanted to build more. They wanted access to certain, you know, streamlined permitting. We wanted um, more low income communities connected. So we did an SPA strategic partnership agreement with them to expedite um, that the access for both ways. And then we found that they're, they have foundations as, as a part of that, um, that will give money to uh, digital connectivity. The last group is your, your university. You absolutely need to talk. If you have a business improvement district, great. Work with those private nonprofit business improvement district leadership. Um, if you don't, contact your small business development center. The regional Los Angeles Small Business Development Center has free consultants. They're excellent. We use them every single day. We use them to screen for our loan packages. We use them to screen for business planning. We use them to help businesses go online. They do trainings, they do webinars. Don't do the technical assistance yourself. Leverage somebody else who's already doing it and then engage with your university. Uh, what we've found is that not only do the business schools want to do marketing plans, not only do they want to do uh, online business planning uh, for small businesses, they have capstone projects that they need businesses to work with. But in some cases that you also will find that um, they have students who actually want to do uh, you know, they either need to or they, they want to do uh, service learning and working with small businesses to get them online, uh, develop websites, those kinds of things. So don't do it yourself. Like I said, we've got a little tiny mighty team that really are real. They're good at making friends and uh, finding partners in the region to help a business um, uh, go online. Um, but yeah, you absolutely have to do it. And we saw it even more so in the COVID uh, emergency. So we are running out of time and I want to give you both time to do a final thought. Just real quickly, two real quick questions. Are there any specific programs or support for non-English um, entrepreneurs? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so what we have been doing uh, locally is um, number one, your, your SBDC, your small business development center, um, LA region, it's great, but they're, they're in every region across the, the state. Um, they, they typically, uh, at least they do for us, have multilingual business consultants. So number one is call the SBDC, say, hey, 
I want to have weekly conversations with you guys and what you're doing and what you can provide and support small businesses. Um, their number, their link, their email should be on your website so that businesses can find them. And then um, ask them about uh, that range, that multilingual range. In fact, SBDCs, they get money from a couple, many different sources, local leverage, federal. They're trying to broaden their connectivity to entrepreneurs of color, um, immigrant entre entrepreneurs, multilingual entrepreneurs. So they, have, they, they are challenged to source a, a more diverse pool of entrepreneurs and they're very motivated to find those resources and deploy those resources. Um, but we also, here's what we've done. So we've formed um, partnerships with our community-based organizations. These are typically social service type organizations, whether it's a, a Latino serving nonprofit called Centro Cha, a, a Cambodian serving nonprofit called United Cambodian Community. We are working with them um, to, to build up their, uh, what we call business navigator programs. So we didn't try to create something new. What we did is we went to an existing uh, uh, multilingual, multicultural, or um, a specific um, community-based uh, organization that has a certain affinity or affiliation um, with the community. And we are just adding content. We are just adding a new uh, value add uh, line of business that they can now provide. So, and I know Nick, he's doing, he's been doing this for years in terms yeah. of working through the CBOs to deliver your, your projects in a culturally appropriate yeah. way. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add to that real quick. Uh, last year in Long Beach, we were able to leverage a $100,000 uh, philanthropic investment into an effort to really understand uh, the needs of the minority um, entrepreneur com community, really do a, a gap analysis on our ecosystem and, and start to think about how we see that ecosystem to serve them better. And we've, we've leveraged that effort into a continued investment from the city's uh, CDBG, CDBG dollars um, um, to continue that type of support. John, John talked about how we use community-based organizations to kind of um, penetrate, that, penetrate that market and then continue to evolve um, the, the services, services and offerings um, that we would make available to them. And then we underwrite uh, some of the development of the materials to support them um, through the city's language access funds. Perfect. So we are running out of time and I want to give our speakers one final thought. John and Nick, you've given us so much great information. Is there one thing, one tip that you want to leave um, the audience with? Nick, go ahead. You go first. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, the, the, the power of, of what you do is, is in, in the partnerships. Um, you know, John and I could spend a lot of time uh, tripping over one another. Uh, we don't. Uh, we're intentional about how the workforce and the economic development strategy align. Uh, we use our assets complementarily um, uh, to, to leverage one another's time and, and effort. And at the end of the day, um, John says this all the time, both of us want to see Long Beach businesses and residents uh, make more money and that's what it's all about yeah i i would say last thought is actually two pieces number one is um that don't put so much pressure on yourself um you don't have to come up with all the ideas um it really is going to be through um partnerships you don't have to have a big budget and you don't have to have a lot of great ideas you just have to be a constant networker um facilitate uh, ecosystem uh, building uh, and bringing partners together around problems. And then number two is, um, it's about helping people make more money. It's not about making City Hall more money. City Hall will make more money if, if businesses and workers and, and investors are making more money. So you have to focus on the user. You have to focus on helping the community make more money. And guess what? Self-interest, uh, reciprocity, um, you will get a return on that investment, but always focus on the user. Design your organization around the user and bring whoever to the table to reach that user and support that user that's required to help them make more money. And, and, I, and I, I believe that you will uh, also accomplish your mission of helping the city to, to pay its bills as well.
Megan, before you close, I, I guess I'd be remiss if we didn't um, give everybody one more parting gift. So if we could have them look under their chair. <laughs> what? Oh my gosh, this was an Oprah favorite thing moment. Good work, Nick. I totally blanked. So. Good work, Nick. Everyone, thank you so much. The party and gift are these slides will be available at cities.org backslash coronavirus. Uh, I have to really thank our two speakers. They've been wonderful. They've given a lot of information and um, given you things to really think about in your community. Um, our next webinar, we're going to continue with the economic development track. We're going to talk to two cities about how they're specifically looking at economic development in their cities. So please sign up for that at cacities.org backslash events. And thank you all so much for joining. Nick and John, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and help. All right, go beach. Thank you. Thank you guys.